Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please stand. Our gospel is recorded in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 41. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going to, up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Less is more. I see unseen things. Deep down, you are really shallow. I save money by spending money. Anyone know what these are? Each one of these is an example of a paradox. A paradox is this literary term that it's a sentence that has two things that are generally opposites. Two things that are generally opposites, they seem to contradict each other, but in the same way, they still somehow make sense in our mind. So when I say the phrase, less is more, you know that shouldn't make sense, but yet, it does. You know that there are certain situations in life where having less actually means having more. Or being able to see something that's unseen. Can you see love? Well, kind of, right? You can see unseen things. Can you save money by spending money? Well, sure. There are all sorts of situations in life where that's possible. But you have these phrases, these paradoxes, where you have two things that don't make sense, but yet they still do. Let me give you one more example of this. The humble king. The humble king. This is a paradox because by nature, kings are normally somebody who is up here, right? They're the leader, the ruler, the one everyone looks to, the one who rules the nation, the kingdom. And somebody who is humble is usually somebody who is down here. That's kind of the nature of humility, is making yourself lower, putting others above yourself. So when you take this idea of a king who is a humble king, that shouldn't make sense to us. It doesn't make sense to our minds. Because for kings out there, their number one goal is always to maintain their throne and protect the kingdom. Kings always are looking, scanning for threats that are out there that might try and attack their kingdom, might try and steal the throne. So instead, kings always try and portray themselves as guys who are big and mighty and powerful uh, so they don't have to deal with enemies or anybody out there that's trying to steal the throne. That's why throughout history you have guys who have names like William the Conqueror, Vlad the Impaler, Cyrus the Great. They give themselves these big, mighty, powerful names as to try and scare other people. I know a lot of you out there, you have... Uh, Wizard of Oz on the mind, right? With the, the play over at West that I saw this weekend. It's coming up at Holy Trinity too. And there's the scene in the Wizard of Oz. Do you remember it? Dorothy walks into the throne room of Oz and Oz says, I am Oz, the great and terrible. And Dorothy says, I am Dorothy, the small and meek. And that's just an example of how we approach kings. Kings are big and mighty and terrible and powerful and servants are supposed to be small and meek. But as we look at this Palm Sunday, we see Jesus, who is the king of the universe, as a humble king. Somebody who is a king, but yet acts like a small servant. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look through the story of Palm Sunday, and we're going to see all the examples that Jesus gives us of his humility. And as we look at our own lives, and as we see how often we've struggled with pride and trying to raise ourselves up, we all have to admit that Jesus is that humble king that we need as our savior. So I read to you the opening verses that I read to you before from Luke chapter 19. Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. So if you were a disciple of Jesus at this point in Jesus' ministry, you would have known that Jesus was a guy who had things very planned and calculated. Nothing that Jesus did was ever just a coincidence. He, he very carefully planned out his ministry. And on this Palm Sunday, we see Jesus doing just that, very specifically choosing his image, what he would look like as he would go into Jerusalem. And when he picks his animal of choice, he picks a donkey. A donkey that had never been ridden before. Back in Jesus' day, there was this thing called the triumphal procession. It was this idea that they had a standard procedure for when an emperor or a general that had just won a war would ride into town. And these generals, these leaders, you know what they would often pick as their animal of choice? Usually a majestic white stallion. Sometimes they would sit on the back of a gold-encrusted chariot, and they would be pulled into town by these majestic steeds, these white horses, and soldiers would line up in the streets and shout their praises. But when Jesus picks his animal of choice, he picks the lowest one possible, a donkey. A donkey that had never been ridden before. He picks an animal that is just big enough to support his weight, but as small as possible to show that Jesus is close to the ground. This is unlike any other triumphal procession that happened back in Jesus' day. And a couple weeks ago, I got to go to a Timberwolves game. They were playing my Milwaukee Bucks. And one of my favorite things about uh, a sporting event is when they do the introductions. Can you picture it? So they're about to have tip off and before that, the lights go dim. And then they put on some loud music. They have the crowd stand to its feet and the crowd is hooting and hollering and shouting. And then the announcer comes in and announces the players. Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Edwards. And you know, the people continue to celebrate. And the cool thing that I saw that game is that when they said the player's name, they put fire up into the sky at once. It was really cool. But can you imagine, after the announcer says all the players' names, that afterwards he says, Jesus Christ! And after the lineup of players, out trots a donkey. A donkey so small with Jesus riding on it that he probably had to ride it side saddle because he would have been dragging his feet on the ground. We have a way of celebrating our celebrities, our leaders, our rulers, and the donkey's not part of it. Back in Jesus' day, they had a way of celebrating their leaders and rulers, and the donkey wasn't part of it. So what was Jesus doing here? Well, there's a verse from the Old Testament that explains what Jesus was doing. It's recorded in Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. On this Palm Sunday, Jesus is fulfilling these words, that their king, the coming Messiah, would come not in his might and power and strength and violence. Instead, he would come in humility, lowly, riding on a donkey, Jesus is showing us by picking this animal that as he rides into Jerusalem that he wasn't a king like other kings. Instead, he was a king that would ride into Jerusalem to defeat his enemies, not with his strength, but with his humility. That's why Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it must have been an incredible sight to see Jesus riding in. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices. 
So as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, people wave their palm branches. It's a sign of victory. They're waving it out of respect for Jesus. And they're shouting praises to Jesus. And they're even taking off their cloaks, their jackets, and laying it in the path for Jesus to walk over. And that would have been quite the sacrifice back in Jesus' day. They're not good Minnesotans with a closet dedicated to winter jackets. Back in Jesus' day, they would have had maybe one, maybe two jackets. And that's their one cloak that they would use uh, to sacrifice to make a path for Jesus to ride in on. A wonderful sight to see so many people celebrating, praising King Jesus. But on one side you see praises, but on the other side there's rejection. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. That is a crazy thought. Because what Jesus is experiencing is basically the same thing that our human hearts crave so much. Jesus literally has thousands of people lined up singing his praises. But what Jesus shows us is he doesn't care so much about the outward human praise. Instead, Jesus cares about the heart. The Pharisees rejected Jesus. They wanted Jesus to tell his disciples to be quiet, to silence them. But Jesus says, if I silence my disciples, as God, he can make the rocks cry out, which is a crazy thought. But then in this moment, after having so many people sing his praises, Jesus looks over the Jerusalem skyline and begins to weep. Jesus cries because he knows there are so many people out there who he desires to save, who he wants to show his love to, so many people out there that will continue to reject Jesus as King and Messiah and Savior. There's something interesting I noticed recently. Um, it's when, you know, the question that you love to ask children, what do you want to be when you grow up? I feel like uh, I've seen that answer change in the past few years. Because I feel like in the past growing up when people would ask me that question or just years ago, you know, the common answers what you would get from a kid, um, I want to be a famous football player, famous athlete, or an astronaut. But you know what I've heard quite a bit nowadays if you ask a kid that? I want to be a famous YouTuber. <laughs> Have you heard that before? Uh, that so many kids, their dream is to make videos and to have so many people watch their videos. And the reason I bring that up is because there's something inside of us, something inside of us that just loves this idea of being famous, of having so many people have their eyes on us uh, to see what we do. Uh, we often call that pride. And pride gets so bad that it gets to the point in our life where whenever you do anything good, the motives are usually messed up. I do something good, and immediately I want that pat in the back. I want somebody to acknowledge my work. I want somebody to tell me all the good things that I have done. And because of this pride, because of this ego, we get so self-centered. And the danger with that, because of our sinful nature, is instead of giving glory to God, giving our praises to God, we often turn to ourselves and praise ourselves. That's the warning. That's our sinful nature. The sinful nature, instead of praising Jesus, we want to praise ourselves. And because of that, because of that, God has every right to treat us as his enemies. If we're not going to live like people in his kingdom, he has every right to treat us as his enemies. And there's nothing we can do to fix that. But that's why each one of us needs to acknowledge that we need a humble king. We need that humble king who rode into Jerusalem. We can't live that perfect life. We're always going to struggle with our sinful nature and our pride and our ego. But that's why what Jesus did is so remarkable. And what Jesus did reminds me of a story I saw by a guy named Kyle Copeland. A couple months ago, this news story came out about Kyle Copeland. Dad charges through hell onto fire engulfed the bus to rescue his kids. Kyle's family was traveling in a motorhome when the worst possible thing happened. A propane tank at the bottom of the motorhome exploded. 
And Kyle and his wife weren't in the motorhome at the time, but his children were. And in an interview, Kyle described the scene. He saw the flames. There were so many flames in this motorhome that he said it looked like hell. But Kyle willingly faced that hell, ran through the flame, and pulled his children out of the motorhome. He had to sacrifice his own body. He got so many severe degree burns on his body, but he did that to rescue his children. And on this Palm Sunday, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, we see that he did the same thing for us. We see that Jesus willingly looked over Jerusalem, and he knew what he had waiting for him. Whips, nails, rejections, beatings. And he faced it for us. Jesus saw what he would have to go through to sacrifice us, and he willingly did it. And that is the paradox of Palm Sunday, that the king acts like a servant, that the exalted one makes himself humbled, that the one who is lifted up high lowers himself. We have a king who gave up his life so that we could have life, a king who died so that we could have eternal life, we have a king who was found guilty so that we could be found innocent. We have a king who was rejected so that we could be found accepted by God. And that's the paradox. It shouldn't make sense to us. It doesn't make sense to us that why would God do something for us like that? But that's the type of king that we have. King Jesus, who is unlike any other king, the humble king. And take a moment what that means. Take a moment and realize that Jesus is king. He is almighty, all-powerful, and still in control of this universe, and powerful and mighty enough to destroy sin, death, and the devil. But he's the humble king. The humble king who doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. The humble king who is compassionate towards us and forgives us. That's the type of king that we have. So on this Palm Sunday, we worship our kings. Like that crowd, we raise our voices, we shout Hosanna, and we sing to our king because our humble King Jesus is unlike any other king. We do this all in his name. Amen.